Welcome to Future Role Model, a podcast that praises the unconventional and redefines what it means to be a role model. I'm super excited to be back at Comedy Pop-Up today for the third week in a row because I'm always somewhere else and it's nice to actually be in Los Angeles for a chunk of time. And today in the studio I have with me Valerie Tosi. Oh, it's, oh, I should have told you. It's Tosi. Is it Tosi? Why everybody do I does always it. say Tosi? You know what though? Everybody does it. Yours is the easiest name and how is that one that it's I fucked up? It's four letters and everyone does it wrong. T I've, I've pronounced, there's like the short shortest names are the ones I always have pronounced wrong the whole time. And the most fucked up names, I always get right. I, do. I don't know what that is. I think it's because you, we Tossy. spend so much time on long ones where we see those names and we're like, no, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to nail it. Yeah. And then the four letter ones are like, no, I know it's And I on. watch you get brought to the stage all the time. And how do I still fuck that because up? Because most of them say it wrong. Say too. it wrong. Okay. <laughs> I was like, how do I have that in my head that it's just tossy? All right. Well, we just last saw each other at Boss Comedy, me and Courtney's show. Yes. Before you shot Conan. And we're going to get to all the backstory and all that stuff. Before. Good. But I love uh, that's really exciting that you just shot Late Night. Yeah. And how was that experience? It's wild. Like, it, it's crazy because it's only been a month since it happened. But because it was right before Christmas and, you know, the New Year it feels like it was literally a year ago. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. really, it's really I mean, it weird. was last year. So. It, it, yes, <laughs> theoretically. Everyone's like, has your life changed? I was like, it's been a month. I mean, no. No. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, and uh, people don't realize, because I have a lot of friends that have done, you know, like, <laughs> credits now are just, there's so much shit. Everyone's doing so much shit mm -hmm. that it's like, credits, you need them. Like, yeah. th they help you get booked on other things, but late night doesn't change your life the way that it used to. Yeah, we were talking about that too. Yeah. Where like before, if you had a late night credit, you could tour off of that for two years. Yes. And now there's just so many late night shows that it's like, yeah, it's cool that you can say, like when now when people are like, what's your credit? I'm like, oh, Conan, which is rad. And I'm very thankful for the whole experience. But it's nuts because it really doesn't change much. There's just so many shows now. It's yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And there's just period, there's so much content like, I went to, um, <laughs> I've been sleeping on my couch lately, uh, long story short for my regular listeners, but m me and my fiance are splitting. Oh no, I'm and so, so sorry. Yeah, so we've been, we've been together for nine years, um, but we're still living together right now and trying to sort everything out like properly. We're really, we really care about each other. Yeah. So I've been sleeping on my couch, which means I've been actually watching TV at night because we don't have a TV in the bedroom. And, uh. The, the, there are so many shows that are popping up that are like, hey, are you still interested in watching this? That I haven't watched in like two or three years. That's how much content is out there. <laughs> I haven't literally watched season two of most of the shows I ever started watching like well, three years so ago. Well, it's so hard, especially <laughs> because it's, it's weird because, you know, like now when a show comes out, most of the time they drop the entire season. So you yes. binge through it all in two days and then we're – uh, ready for more immediately mm -hmm. but when it takes another year for them to release it it's like you forget about it yeah and then it comes out and you're like i do not remember what happened on the show at all yeah because you watch it in a week yeah and then you have to wait if you have to wait more than four months for another season you're like I, what is even happening we're <laughs> awful now we consume <laughs> stuff so quickly i know and it's, it's like gross. we're just we're very insatiable as a society yep. now and it's so gross we're, it's terrifying yeah. even just um what was i watching the other day hulu has two different shows that just came out one with vanity fair with um it's like two minute bites of these celebrities sitting in the same room so it's just one set um showing their hidden talents have you seen that no uh, but i'm very intrigued it's i mean it's great like <laughs> reese witherspoon does like southern slang and like nicole kidman eats bugs and you just different people of just course do. she does she's from australia she's it's the only way to survive she's <laughs> like what did i know exactly she's like such an intriguing human being too. yeah she's very like can't really she just doesn't even seem like a human and then she's just snacking on bugs all posh and like that's so eating funny. them with a chopstick and i'm like you're so <laughs> bizarre yeah well she's and so I femme it. that you'd, you'd be like yeah you'd think that she would like scream and run in the other room no she was like oh these are delicacies and just plopping them in her mouth with a chopstick can but, you imagine like right? there's a cockroach running across the floor and you're just like screaming you? and she's like oh i'll take that for later i'm hungry yeah, yeah. <laughs> pack it up to go box for me and then um, there's another show on Hulu for Tinder takeovers, where comedians are taking over somebody's Tinder. Oh my God! And it's just all it is is them on a white, like a white background with it showing the phone screen. That's the, these are TV shows now, and we watch them. We, yeah, I just started watching <laughs> The Circle, and I, I will never get that time of my life back. <laughs> oh my God! It's, is it bad? It's like a real life Black Mirror. No, like it's it's very trippy and it's it's so funny to watch. It's a real show, like yes. So basically, the show is the the whole concept of the show is that there's I think it's like eight people are living in uh, like a 
an apartment building, I guess, where everybody has their own unit, where nobody knows what the other one looks like, except for whatever they post on their on their like circle social media. So you can be yourself, or you can catfish and and be somebody completely different. And it's like the interactions, and then like if you get voted, you know, the two people that have the best social media presence are like the influencers of the group, and people get voted off. I just started it. It's very, it's a lot, and. <laughs> Oh, that sounds so terrifying. It hurts my heart watching it because it, it's just, it's so <sighs> bizarre where that's the stuff that we're like consuming now. Yeah. You know? Like I never watched, I was never into reality TV, but I started watching this because literally everybody I know was talking about it. I was like, I kind of need, even if for anything else, just to like understand the jokes that people are making on Twitter mm-hmm. about it. Right. I know. And it's, it's very wild. It's hard for me to watch a lot of, th- it's, it's interesting because we always have to be pitching ourselves as comics. We have to, you know, build a social media and mm-hmm. always have, like, I hate the amount of social media that I have to do yep. just to like pitch myself for shit. Honestly, if I could, if I didn't need it for comedy, I would delete every single Same. thing. Same. So today. Because like, I already love, like, I travel so much. My favorite thing, and I can't wait until I'm in a position to actually do this, because I have a podca- another podcast I want to start called Beers with Old People. I just want to, like, sit down and get old people's stories. Um, but, let me know if you need a host, because that sounds amazing. <laughs> yes. And oh. um, so uh, I'm, I, I love to travel, and I love to meet people, and I have, like, so many journals full of stories from these travels. Like, You are so much of a cooler person if that's your reason for traveling and meeting people, not because you want to show people Mm -hmm. the shit on Instagram that you're doing. And and I wish I could just do that and not have to do the showing part. Yeah. I feel like I'd be so much more satisfied as a human being. I realize, too, and I wonder if you feel like this, when you're in places, because, you know, one of the best parts of being a comedian is the ability to travel so often and to so many different places that you otherwise would never really have a reason to go to. Yeah. And I've found myself now, it's so much harder to be, to be wowed and to like feel that feeling of wow. Yeah. Where I'm somewhere where, and I need, what I mean is like, you're somewhere in a place you've never been. It's beautiful outside. And like, I remember feeling like very overwhelmed when I was younger, that with that sense of wonder and being like, this is really amazing and being very present and very in the moment. Yeah. Where now like you'll be driving on the road to a gig and you're surrounded by beautiful wilderness and your face is in a phone. Yeah. And, and you're not even yep. looking up and yep. it's so hard to break that habit. It's it awful. Is. Yeah. And and even if you're not trying to be guilty of it, you are yeah. like everybody is guilty of that. Even in, um, God, last spring when me and Rachel O'Brien did our Europe tour, mm-hmm. when we produced the whole thing and we set it up, it took us months to, pr- to prep and to plan and to get all the venues and the hotels and like all this stuff. We finally get to Europe and we were so, just because, you know, when you produce something, you want it to be successful. Mm -hmm. We were so worried about our ticket sales every morning when we were like checking the websites and like trying to promote. We were not enjoying the fact that we were in like Paris or London. Like the days that we had, the day we thankfully gave ourselves a cushion day after we had our show to actually enjoy that city. You're so smart because I've been places where I haven't done that. Yeah. and, And you miss out so much. Oh, I know. And we were both really trying hard to be like, okay okay, we need a day to just go explore. We need a day to go do this and not think about. Um, but it was tough because yeah. you still want to like have when you're when you're work life balancing like that constantly, like we always are with comedy. Almost everywhere I go, I do shows. I'm sure you do the same thing. Yeah. Well, it's like our excuse to go anywhere because a, a yes. lot of times you can be like, um, you're wow, that is so loud. I um, know. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, hello. Uh, but yeah, like when you go somewhere, it's you it's like you have it's it's also this weird like obsessive feeling where you're like oh I have to do something while I'm there like even when yes. I went to I went to Maine to like uh where was I um not Portland Maine but like I forget I was somewhere in Maine for a wedding mm-hmm. and I literally was like oh I have to do a show while I'm here yeah, I got to like fly in psycho. earlier. Stay like, I know. Like a psycho. Like you People can't are like, just are you go. gonna be there? Are you gonna be there for, like after? I'm like, I gotta leave early. I gotta go do a set. Everyone's like, what? You're in. Yeah, I know. You're in, I know. <laughs> you're and in a peony gown right now. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Like, you're gonna really go to bridesmaid to. Yeah. Yeah, Ugh. and it's it's a guilty like it's something we're all guilty of just because we have to hustle so fucking hard. Mm-hmm. We're used to doing that. I almost got in trouble one time, and I don't know if you've been in this position, but years ago I was featuring for um, I probably shouldn't say which company it was, but it was like a they run a bunch of comedy clubs mm-hmm. and bookings in the Midwest. Um, I was featuring for somebody who's a good friend of mine, and 
of course I'm thinking I got to be doing like two shows a night to be like this was like five six years ago where you just feel like you always have to be on stage much more than you do later and I booked an extra show just at a bar just to like go and do and the the company got really mad at me they're like you're doing a competing show I'm like I'm I'm I didn't even think about it. I'm just trying to get stage time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the like grind, man. The, the, the grind. grind. Ah, fuck. So, Isn't, oh, man. Yeah. Like I, I when I shot um, an episode of Stand Against Evil last year when I was in Atlanta, I, I, you know, we had five or six days of filming for our episode. And this is how psychotic I am. <laughs> I would be on set for like 12 hours or however long. And everyone would be like, oh, all right, well, are you coming back to the condo? Like, what do you do to see? And I'm like, no, I got to go. I have two sets tonight. They're like, you just did 12 hours on set. Now you're going to do two shows tonight. Right. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm insane. Martyrs. We're I know. <laughs> I know. It really like, is. No one else does that. You know that, right? I'm like, I, I have a problem. Yeah. I mean, oh. and, and it's a good, I mean, it's a good thing in some ways because it shows that you have a hustle, but also at some point you have to be like, okay, I got to like not die I've sometimes. also learned too and I'm sure you feel this way like the longer I've been doing comedy and the older I get I'm like you know what quality over quantity yes there's no way now, I'm gonna yes. do like eight mics that suck in a week yeah I'd rather do one show and have a good show and prep for that show yep. and get like you know what I mean and actually get something out of it yeah than just going to a mic for the sake of going to a mic exactly and that's what I started to do this year I was just telling Paul before that but like when you go through something kind of life-altering in your life like because I feel like my life is totally blowing up right now and I'm just trying to remove things from my plate that don't really make sense, that aren't mm-hmm. lucrative, that are just overstressing. I was in Vegas for this, this third, the last third of last year. I was in Vegas every week with my residency there. Yeah, I remember you telling me about it. Yeah. And I was just tired by the end of the year of going somewhere every week. That's awful. And so... I decided to um, move it to monthly, and then I called when this all stuff happened in, like, my relationship, uh, like, 10 days ago. I called the venue, and I was like, listen, I I need to just take things off my plate for the month of January so I can take care of myself. And they were like, we totally get it. Let's start up at the end of February. Like, people get it. That's really really nice that they understand. I think that the problem is in this industry, we're so used to hustling that we forget – we think that everything's going to, like, move on without us if we need some time. Mm-hmm. And it's just everything is still going to be there. And if you're, like, if people that you're working with are any sort of decent human beings, they don't mind. Yeah. You know? We also have to learn to self-advocate, too, because a lot of times we're so worried about offending somebody or seeming like we, um, you know, are, are, I don't know, just like like we think we're better than somebody else or whatever. And yeah. it's like, no, we're people and we need to sleep. And yeah. take care of ourselves. Yep. And that's okay. Like, it's okay to say no. Yep. We need time with our families. Yep. We need time for our relationships. And you need that stuff to actually make you a more well-rounded person to, it's like like filling the well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you need to be able to come back because y- you don't have more stories. You, like, you dry up. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, honestly. Like, and, like, th- since, like, in the holidays, I spent two weeks home with my family. And then since this all happened, and it's, like, the most interesting place to be in such an agreeable loving decision to separate with somebody mutually that like it's infused a lot of my creativity I've written so much in the last like six weeks just because I've actually taken time to be around people and to deal with some stuff that I've needed to deal with if that makes sense and if you don't do that you just feel stuck Mm -hmm. and when you feel stuck you can't fucking write that was me like it last like this this year well I guess 2019 I had a couple of months where I felt very, very, very stuck mm-hmm. because you do. You're like, you feel like you're not in control of your own life for a part of it. You feel like you're like nothing's coming to you because you're in a state of like panic almost. Yeah. And it's so hard to when you're in that to write from that place. Yeah. Where like for me, the thing I did was I was like, well, what am I in control of? And the one thing I was like, well, I can start working out and make myself feel better, at least physically. Mm -hmm. And like that's what kicks started me going back to the gym and whatever, because I'm like, at least that's one thing I can do on my own. Yeah. You know, it's like the one and and even though I've been dealing with a bunch of stressful stuff the last couple of weeks, I'm like, at least I'm handling it in a way that's healthy because I feel like my endorphins are high enough. Yeah. Like I can I can figure I've been doing the same thing. I've I've always turn to like being physical when I'm stressed out just Mm -hmm. because it's better than other shit you know I never really turn to like drinking or whatever I'm more of a happy drinker like I drink to celebrate I don't drink to wallow 
Same with like, me. Nobody wants to be the girl at the bar being like, Ugh. yeah, right. <laughs> I lost we've, 25 Instagram followers. <laughs> right. Today. We've uh. all seen that person. And that's not a per- that's not a good look on anybody. Yeah. But I'm also going to be 35 next month. So it's like, oh, we're so close. Then when's your birthday? February 18th. When's yours? Mine's March 19th. Ah. And I will also be 35. Yes. Hey. And I love talking about age. Like, I have no problem with it. Me I, either. And I feel like it's so nice to be in a weird <laughs> It's so nice to be in a very weird, very emotionally taxing and t- difficult part of your life as a true adult. Because mm-hmm. I have been through things like this before, but you handle things differently. You learn a lot about yourself. Yeah. Like, just how, y- like, nothing's malicious. Like, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but it's just like, I'm, I'm feeling out this 35 approach and I'm like I like this I like 35 on me <laughs> like yeah. the way that I think now I do too <laughs> I, I I it's funny like I joke a lot about like how exhausting it is to be in your 30s because you're just you know you're physic you're physically it, you, you tire a lot easier <laughs> when you're in your 30s <laughs> but like mentally you're just in such a better place uh-huh. and you like I now in my th- I remember in my 20s that I constantly feel like I had to go out I had to go out I had to go out and now in my 30s, I'm like, I love being home. Yeah, I don't feel like that at all. It's so great. Like last night, oh. I ha- got done shooting all day yesterday, and all these people were like, hey, come out, come out and meet me. We have this Grammys party and this blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, the last thing I want to do is meet like a bunch of rappers right now. <laughs> like I, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm emotionally drained from the last couple of weeks. Like I want to go and just like. I don't know, yeah. dr- drink fancy champagnes with people that I don't know. It doesn't even sound fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to like be in the right mindset for it too. Like I, I did this show last night that was part of why I'm so tired today. I did this show last night. That was probably my most, the most fun I've had on a show ever. I did. I show. love those. Oh my God. So the show is called Make It Rain. And it's Melanie Vesey and Gina Bloom's show. They do it at Cheetah's. It was only their second one. So Cheetah's, for those of you that don't know, is a strip club. Yeah. And uh, it basically what you do is you do a seven-minute set like normal, like a regular comic. And then you pick a three-minute song and you uh, dance and strip to a three-minute song. No way. It was the most fun I've ever had because it was like – You actually strip too? I liked it. Like, like, like strip a light. Yeah, yeah, like diet stripping. Yeah. But it was very – it was so fun because everybody – you think you know a comic by like what they're talking about and like – material but it's so much more revealing with what people choose for their song because everybody was so authentically themselves and it was so fun to watch like Maggie May who's super funny yeah she's gonna be on our show she's so great so she just she did Paramore's misery business and she literally she was like talking about how she's like oh I don't ever work like I don't go to pole dancing class like you know I'm 37 I'm probably gonna whatever and then she got out she like stripped down to this like little silver number and then was like down in booty shorts she was like climbing up the pole whipping around I mean it was like breathtaking I want to do this show <laughs> it was so much fun my god I'm gonna have to have you connect me to these people it was so it fun because so fun. like after she was done like when I got up I was laughing because I'm like Maggie I just want you to know that I watched you and halfway through your set I was like I have to take two Dramamine because I'm not going to be able to survive <laughs> going on that ring. So I literally took two Dramamine, oh a shot of tequila, and a hit off of my vape pen. And I was like, oh, that's the 30-something cocktail. Like, yeah. that's what you need yeah. to just have a regular experience. Yeah, like, yep, yep. Just a little bit of everything. It was the most fun. Like, I did Britney Spears is crazy. Oh, yes. I It was so fun. Oh, my God. That sounds like something so up my alley. It was the best. Just just because it sounds so freeing. It was so fun. And it was men and women on the show. Mm-hmm. And it was like... The the audience was super into it. Like every and, did you oh, choreograph pre- preemptively? No, okay. I, this, this was my thing because I have a tendency to overthink. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna go in. I'm, I'll know my song in advance, but otherwise, I'm not gonna overthink it. And I knew that if I smoked a little pot and had a little tequila, I would be like fun, silly, and like the inhibitions would not be there. Yeah. <laughs> and I had the best time. Oh, by the way, people are throwing singles at you while you're doing yes. it. So you're like throwing money in the air and rolling around and yes. it's like, oh my God. I'm like, now I know why JLo agreed to do Hustlers. Yeah, this no shit, shit is so fun. And also <laughs> because she's like 50 and... she's a, Her body is in a shape that I like, I couldn't even be like genetically <laughs> modified to look like that. Like it's insane. Yeah, she's nuts. Ugh. Um so Val, where do, do people call you Val that are close yeah. to you? Okay. That's people what I call me whatever. I don't care. I'm the same. People call me Tosh Nat, Tasha. Yeah. You're like Ash. sure. I'm like <laughs> You're like me, as long as it's not bitch. Whatever that's chunk cool. that you want to call me, even if you want to call me bitch, just do it kind of behind my back or like without out of your <laughs> <laughs> or after I've done something bitchy, then yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um where did you grow up? 
So I'm originally from Lynn, Massachusetts. Okay, so you're East Coast. Uh, I am, yes. Lynn is gross, but um, my <laughs> it's a, it's how a, so? Do it's, you explain? It's like a real trashy beach town, and like I even like I talk, a Jersey Shore or worse. <sighs> With more crime, I think. Like, Jersey Shore just seems, Ooh. like, trashy. But Lynn is is very, very dangerous. I actually I talked about it on my set Damn. with Conan because they have a slogan for Lynn, and the slogan is Lynn, Lynn, City of Sin. You never mm-hmm. come out the way you came in. Yeah. I remember you doing like, that yes. on our show when you were tr- prepping. It's crazy. There's yeah. even more to the rhyme I found out, too. The next part of the stanza is... You ask for water, but they give you gin. The girls say no, but they always give in. Oh my god! Yeah. We're just like, oh, okay. Like, so, so we're you're just rapey. Like, yeah, we're just me tooing a whole city. Yeah, like, no it's, kidding. So it's very dangerous. Is that actually the city song? It's like a slogan that's been around since the 1600s. Oh my god! Because they they were like a big <laughs> factory and like industrial city, and it's oh my just, god, yeah, it was they used to say that it was like a city of vices, is what they used. To, it, yeah. So it was like Sodom and Gomorrah. I guess so. Yeah. Is there a sister city to Lynn? Is there a Gomorrah to? this album probably revere because <laughs> oh that's god. where my mom is from oh my it's, god then my family now they're up in salisbury which is the most northern part of the state and it's funny because it's also a trashy beach town like they both are we just went from like one trashy beach town to another <laughs> perfect but yeah it's awful so i mean did you did you know that it was a trashy city when you were growing up or did it take you until adulthood to realize that oh i knew because um our backyard was the lynn city cemetery Oh, fuck. And I wasn't allowed to play in the front of the house. My parents actually preferred me to play in the graveyard than they did in front of the house. Because it was safer because the people are dead? Yeah. They were like, oh, anybody <laughs> that could have harmed you is already dead. So, like, you're probably better off here. Oh, my God. That's so morbid it's so, on so many levels. so morbid. <laughs> what did you guys used to do to entertain yourself as a kid in Lynn? Um, well, playing in the graveyard really was a thing. Like one, of the, I remember, um, so I, I was a very nerdy kid, and I did not have very many friends when I was little. And so there well, that's because they made you play outside with dead people. I know. <laughs> well, then I was just like, I was. It's funny because I'm very like, I'm pretty outgoing now. Although I'm like a weird. I, I also feel like a loud introvert is kind of my nature. Ooh, that's a good ha- like a tagline. Yeah, and so it's it was weird because like the two kids that live next door to me, their names were Nina and Denny, and they were um, I don't know because I was so little, I don't actually know, but they were they were very sweet Asian American family. They didn't speak much English, so we, when I was a kid, but we, like, you know, when you're kids, you don't care, you just, like, even though there's a language barrier, you're like, we'll figure it out, we're just going to play together, who cares? Yeah. And so we would, like, climb up on the dirt mounds in the cemetery, which is, like, you know, the <laughs> dirt that they removed for the graves. Yeah. And we would go, and they'd have this big trash pile of all the old discarded, like, flowers and things that would say, like, dad or mom, and we would build forts out of the discarded grave site stuff. <laughs> Oh my God! This is so morbid. This is a dark comedy waiting to happen. I know. I know. It's pretty dark. Oh, you need to write that. (laughs) Everybody's told me that. Lynn City, just like fucking go crush it. City of Sin. You never come out the way you came in, and you're just you live here now. You're dead now. (laughs) Did you have siblings, or did you just play by yourself with these graveyard friends? That's that's the weird part is that uh, there's a big age gap between um, because I have a younger sister and a younger brother Mm -hmm. my sister and I are seven years apart and my brother and I are ten years apart and it is the same parents wow very weird yeah what was was there a reason for that or just um uh, the well I mean I think my parents they were young ish when they had me they were early 20s and uh I know my mom had, uh, she had some uh, substance abuse problems when I was younger. Oh, interesting. And so um, I think, you know, I I don't think her getting pregnant again was necessarily planned either. Mm -hmm. And um, and so then, yeah, so then she had my sister. And then my brother was shortly after. So it's very weird because I was an only child for seven years, which is a pretty long time. Yeah. I also tell people, too, I'm like, I also think my parents did it intentionally because they wanted a built-in babysitter. (laughs) Oh, sure. You know what I mean? Because that's kind of what it ended up being. Like, yeah. I was always stuck at home with my brother and sister. And isn't that else crazy to think about? Because, like, I grew up in the Midwest, and I used to start babysitting when I was nine. Mm-hmm. Babies. Like, what? Yeah, How babies watching thing? other babies. Yeah, nine years old. I'm like, I could barely make a sandwich by the time I was nine, let yeah. alone, like, I was holding a baby. Isn't it crazy? It's I really remember, weird. Yeah, like, changing my brother and sister all the time and being, like, eight years old and being like, hey, can you change your brother's diaper? And it's like, what? Oh, my God. It's like, I am just got out of mine. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's so weird. <laughs> yeah, that is. And also, like... I don't know. I mean, it just changes the demographic of how you feel about your siblings, I feel like, because I have a lot of friends who have big gaps like that, even five years, because yeah. it puts you not in high school together, so you don't mm-hmm. really... I even say, too, where they're, like, I feel like, the, I felt like the third parent a lot, and mm-hmm. even now, whenever I go home, I'm like, oh, where are the kids? 
Like, I always refer to them as the kids. Yeah. It's really weird. Not your sister and brother. No, never. And your parents are still together? Mm-hmm. So what was that substance abuse situation like? Is that something you're willing to talk about? Yeah. Um, my mom did a lot of coke when I was a kid. So I know, and she drank a lot. So she went to rehab, I think, a couple I of times. I don't mean to laugh at that. It just seems like such a party drug oh, my parents for a are parent. <laughs> huge partiers, though. Like, they oh, both are wow. huge. This I talk about openly on stage a lot, is that my parents are huge partiers and that they're big stoners. Mm-hmm. And th- they are cool with that. The other, I try to avoid the recovery stuff with my mom because she, my mom is, the thing is, she she's the sweetest. Like, she, her only crime is loving too much. You know what I mean? Like, she right. just, she loves to party. She loves meeting people she's very warm very friendly she's a victim of this social life yeah i think that you know she she came from parents that were also alcoholics and that had substance abuse problems and you know like it's genetic where and she just she really she had a lot of demons when she was younger she was an only child so she thought until later on she found out this is also in my act too but we we just found out like within the last year and a half my mom was a half brother she never knew about for over fifty years. What? My, yeah, that my grandfather actually cheated on my grandmother, and he he knew about it, like he knew that she had a kid, but my mom like nobody else ever knew, which was really like Whoa. crazy. Yeah. It, did you guys find out on some sort of twenty three and Me? Yeah. So somebody in the family did ancestry dot com. My God, I hear so many stories like that. It's now. crazy. It's so crazy. Like people find out has about secret families. Yeah, Everybody. people find out about grandpa and grandpa. Like back in like the war mm-hmm. and like when all that stuff was going on before social media, before people c- could get caught. People went away for like two, three years, and of course they like fucked other people. Yeah, because you're human. What else do you do? What else do you do? <laughs> you're like almost gonna die every day, and so yeah, I'm hearing these stories crop up constantly, and they're it's like, wild. they're like, I don't know how to feel about Opa anymore, but it's like he cheated forty years ago. So what are we gonna do? Yeah, about it's it? like, come on, <laughs> you know. But my grandfather was also not the best person. Like I remember, he um he was a bookie. And he owed somebody money, and so one time he had, like, had to get out of, out of town. So mm-hmm. he left his car at my mom's place, and uh, they set his car on fire in our driveway. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, fuck. Yeah, so there was, like, some <laughs> crazy <laughs> shit. Where everyone's like, did you see the Irishman? I'm like, I kind of lived it. Like, we had a <laughs> car fire in our driveway. So, like, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, no, shit, that's crazy. Yeah. So um, when you were in high school, I mean, did you feel – like you had any sort of connection to your younger brother and sister or were you just kind of floating out by yourself? I, I like that, I think. Yeah. Because I was, t- I had to take care of them so often that I, I looked at them as children and like even om- almost like my own, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I, even now I still like my, uh, you know, both of my brother and sister still live at home. They're, uh, you know, my sister's going to be 28. My brother's going to be 25. Yeah. He'll be 25. And it's just, it's so crazy because the second I turned 18, it was like the stroke of midnight. And I was like, bye. Yeah. And like got out of there. Yep. And so it's crazy to me that they're still, they're still They're at still home. there. My, po- my poor parents are like, we can't get rid of them. Oh my God. <laughs> like, I, I mean, that would be my worst nightmare as a parent. Just like yeah. having to sign up for an extra 10 years of being a parent. Yeah. It was like, oh, 18 years, 18 <laughs> years. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like some people, it's just, for, I mean, it never goes away, but for it to be that direct is like. Well, our generation's <laughs> just gotten so screwed because every, nobody can afford to live. Everyone's so hand to mouth and like. You know, my brother, you know, he's going to be 25. He works at the Boys and Girls Club. He loves his job. The kids love him. But pays nothing. They won't pay him enough. And it's so frustrating because he's working long hours and and every day, like, he's always, you know, willing to answer the phone whenever they need him. And it's so frustrating that it's like, oh, but he can't afford to live on his own. Yeah. That's not right. You yeah. Know? It's it's so frustrating. It's crazy, too, because now is the first time, it, you know, I've lived with my fiance for eight years. I'm now understanding how much property has risen since I've been oh, in girl. my relationship. Oh, girl. We are in rent control. And now that I'm actually looking for a place, I'm like, and now I understand why people fight through relationships. Yeah. You can't afford to live on your own. Well, it's uh, like I told you, I it's was a couple. It's so like, expensive. It's awful. Like I was a couple minutes oh late here God. because we just found out. I also am in a rent controlled building in Hancock Park, and it's amazing. That's close to me. Oh, where where are you? I'm Miracle Mile. Oh, okay. So I was gonna say, yeah. oh, maybe don't say it on your podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm like address now, please. area. <laughs> um, but so our building is amazing, and I've lived there for four years. And I have a gigantic one bedroom apartment. I have parking. My utilities are included. Wow. Like it's it's crazy. Well, they just sold our building. So now we're all panicking because we don't know if they're going to do a buyout, if they're going to – like, we don't know what's happening. So I'm trying – Yeah, because it cannot work a couple different ways, buyouts versus just kick you out with X amount of time. So basically right now is they they legally have to give you 120 days to leave. 
once they give you the notice that they're like, hey, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so they're either going to give us a buyout and you just leave and you take the buyout. Or um, what we heard the rumor that they want to do is they want to turn the building into co-living spaces. Where oh, essentially it's happening so often it's, now. If uh, you're unfamiliar, this is what it's like to live in a city now where they want to do it where it's almost like it's almost like a live in we work. Yeah. Or what they want to do is that turn it into four to five bedroom suites where you have your own bedroom and bathroom and then you share a kitchen and a living room with strangers. Yeah. That sounds awful. I'm like, I, that's an adult dorm. Yeah. I don't want that. They it, have those. They're called um, common. Yeah. They live in, they have uh, LA and New York locations because they came up when I was looking at housing. Yeah. Because I was looking at like furnished places because mm -hmm. I just don't want to deal with refurnishing a place. Yeah. And that those were the first things that come I'm sure be just because of Google. It's crazy. And I'm like, I wouldn't want to do, I don't, I don't trust strangers. Like, Can I don't you imagine I'm, being like, who ate my yogurt at home? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, why is there a bunch of, where is there eight glasses in the sink? Like, I don't want to clean. I won't be somebody's mom. Yeah. You know, it's like, Sounds that, terrible. like I'm not even living with my boyfriend right now because I don't want to play that game. Never mind doing it with somebody that I'm not getting fucked by. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's well, like, and it's like, and it's going to be, and they're expensive. Yeah. Like, so it's co living. They're still like two grand. They're, st they're still, yeah. Or the not ones, more. The ones in New York are like 3,700. Can you imagine? It's like, it's, like, it's insane so you just get a dormitory room yeah. for 3700 i'm like i don't care if a maid comes with this like i i'm a great maid for myself because yeah. i'm fucking 35 <laughs> yeah it's it's crazy it's and so crazy, we're, we're yeah. just waiting because like i said you can take the bio or there's another thing that is a possibility where they have to you have to get rehoused somewhere else within a five mile radius and it has to be comparable to what you have now where you pay whatever you're paying in rent normally and then they cover the difference and it's for until your unit is ready to move back into if they're doing upgrades or whatever. But we don't know what's happening yet because it's been so secretive and no one's told us anything. So we don't know, like, okay, if, will they turn it into co-living? I don't want to move back into that place because I don't want to share, yeah. you know? So it's like, you're. I don't know, it's a whole big thing and it's a nightmare. That's why when you, I was running a few minutes late because I'm trying to get a jump on things and I looked at an apartment today just to get an idea yeah. of like what's out there and what's going on in it. And in it's crazy. It's insane how expensive oh, it is. Oh, I know. I went and looked at in the same neighborhood because I really love where I live. And, me too. And me and my fiance love each other still. And I don't know. I hope we can figure things out and get back together or something. Uh. But um, we we currently, I'm not going to say how much we pay, but it's low for how much space we have. I'll we tell have, you what mine is. I don't care. Mine's under two grand. Yeah, mine is. Oh, mine's very well under that. Um, And we have two bedrooms. We, we turned the second bedroom into a giant walk-in closet. It's amazing. Oh, it's so great. It's so great. comes with parking. And I went and looked at a studio mm -hmm. the other day for that for uh, $400 more expensive than we're paying I right know. now. Doesn't it, it, like, One fucking room. Yeah. One room. It, it hurts. It doesn't have any amenities, either no roof or pool or, like, grill, barbecue area. Oh, my like, God. Like, it's, <laughs> it's so insane. People don't understand, but the, the coastal cities are getting out of fucking hand. It's crazy, too, because now and everyone's like, the traffic is so bad now, too. I'm like, yeah, you know why? Because everyone has to commute in from Torrance or whatever they're yeah. living now. That's so far because no one can afford to live here. Yeah. It like, is really weird. That's one of the things I said to my boyfriend because I was like, look, I'm like, if, if they give me a buyout and it's a substantial buyout, there's part of me that's like, what do I want to do? Be Live comfortably for a year and then be living beyond my means? Or do I want to take it and move to someplace like Atlanta where the film scene is is up and coming? I already you can have still do stand-up. I can still do stand-up because the comedy scene's great. My... um. You know, I, I already have representation there. Mm -hmm. My best friend is a real estate agent. I could, like, she can easily find me a place. Like, I can, you know, I could have a house. I have a friend that just did that. He's um, been a, he's been a series regular and recurring on a bunch of shows. He was living here with his wife and two kids, struggling to cover a two-bedroom apartment. This was, like, two, two years ago, roughly. He moved to Atlanta. Um, his agent was also in Atlanta. And got a two hundred thousand dollar house that's like three stories, yep, or two hundred fifty thousand dollar house or something. Just like he was showing me around it, basically picked out all the stuff himself. Like a really fucking great house, for, for yeah. And yeah. now him and his family live comfortably. He works all the time. Like it's a viable option. I know, and that's the thing is, I don't feel like I'd be giving quote unquote giving up on on my no. dream or whatever if anything you're just relocating yeah you know it's like because everyone's like oh you have to be in either new york or, or la it's and true. it's like it's not true anymore no They're, people live in vancouver I'd, yeah. like, i had a friend who just had to relocate to vancouver for her job and mm -hmm. she had to you know it was a tough thing she had to choose between 
her boyfriend and her life here versus a series regular job on a hit show. And yeah. she's like, I have to take this career move right now. And so she lives in Vancouver. And yeah. like, people do it all the time. And I've thought about that too. I'm like, maybe I should go to London. I'd probably crush it being like the girl I, <laughs> the yeah. girl I am in London. <laughs> it, it's crazy because we're, we're just like, it, it's all, we just, all we want to do is we want to make enough money to live and just create. Yeah. That's truly all it comes down it to. Is. You know, like, yeah, being a millionaire would be super dope. But like, I just want to not have to check my bank account while I'm in line at the grocery store. Yeah. You know what it's I mean? It's a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to be able to set ourselves up for that is just so, it's so taxing here because you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to be mm -hmm. so such an advocate for yourself. Yep. Um, also, just try to be a genuine person because, you know, if you're a piece of shit, that doesn't have any good effect on you eventually. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of people who get far by being pieces of shit, but yep. I figure they eventually get found out. I hope they do. So when did you start being creative as a kid? Like, how did you start to, you know, realize that this was maybe a path that you would go on? I was a weird kid because, like, I I was quieter when I was a kid. Um, I read a lot. Like, that's what I really did was read. That's good. And um, a lot of kids, not enough kids read anymore. Well, especially I now, like. they're just staring at screens. Yeah. But, like, as a kid, I was, like, I was burning through books. Like, Scholastic Book Fair was, like my fucking jam you know i was like <laughs> hell yeah book fair yeah yes but like i did i read a ton and when i was younger when we were still living in lynn i didn't really have any friends because i was a nerdy kid we also were very poor growing up like we you know we were on wick and like all that stuff and i but i went to a private school because it was so dangerous where i lived and i was an only child at the time so my parents were like that if we're gonna funnel money anywhere it's gonna be to keep you safe and put you here mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I had like one friend. And then when we moved, <laughs> it's truly. And then when we moved, um, I was very self-aware. And I was like, okay, well, nobody here knows who I am. I can kind of reinvent myself in a way. Yeah. You know, it was like Stella got her groove back, but like Stella's nine. Do you know you how know? much I've been referring to that movie lately? Really? Yeah, I'll tell you off air, but I have a, a something. Yeah. It's I have something, really funny. I love that movie. God damn. It's what I think about every minute when I'm trying to like just feel like a person with what I'm dealing with right now. I'm yeah. like, Natasha, get your groove back. Yeah. Get your groove back. You have to. <laughs> but like as a kid, I had to do that because I was like, I don't want to, I want to have friends here and I want to do stuff. And so that's how, you know, when I was a kid, I would draw a lot. I'm not an artist, but, like, I just really liked it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the resources to do, like, acting or band or anything when I was real young going to that school because they just didn't offer those things. Right. Then when we moved, a bunch of my friends were in band, and I was like, well, I want to play an instrument. And, and which city um, was it that you moved to? Salisbury, Mass. Okay. Yeah. And so um, – my parents' friends were like, well, we have an old clarinet that's been sitting in our attic forever. So if you want that, I was like, yes. <laughs> so I got into band. I learned clarinet. I played bass clarinet. Uh, I learned piano. When I went to college, I um, played trombone. I like l taught myself. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. You were the. Oh, my God. Such you were like dork. the actual band oh, person. Such a fucking <laughs> dork. And bass, so, clarinet <laughs> and trombone are like the unsexiest. Oh, yeah. What did you play? I played the, flute. Yeah. I played flute. It's fine. I'm okay. not that much cooler. We get it. You're like the super hot band girl. <laughs> I was like, what can I play that's obnoxious and everyone will hate? <laughs> um, but I did. I like I was a huge band nerd. I, then I got into theater and all that when I was in high school and in college. And I moved out here, and I didn't even really know what I wanted. Like, I – because before I lived out here, I um, was really just, like, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with myself because I went to college for a little while, hated the program, and so I left. And so in between that and here – I worked at a police department and was a 911 dispatcher for three no, and a half years. No, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Wait, before you moved to L.A.? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Okay, yeah. tell some stories from that. Everyone's like, how? Like people will come up to me and they're like, I don't know how you do stand-up. Like, that's going to be the scariest thing ever. I'm like, no. <laughs> Not 911 like, dispatch, yeah, for sure. Like, you have to, you're, you essentially have people's lives in your hand, and that is so much scarier. Holy fuck. Where I worked was, you know, it was a, it was the town... Uh, it was a town next to where my folks were, and it was also the same town that my high school was in. So we saw a lot of familiar faces come through. Sure. But um, because I was a dispatcher for the police department, so it was you know, but I was also doing all the nine one one calls and EMS and fire and all that, and it was wild because I was there for you know three and a half years. And then what I, age was it? Was it from? I was. 
20, I think, when I started there. So, like, also just had no business doing this. Yeah, you know? that's, like, such a stressful Can you imagine a 20-year-old yeah. answering your 911 call? Yeah. I, They're I like, how do I resuscitate my grandma? And you're like, uh. uh, uh. I don't trust a 20-year-old to book me a nail appointment. No. Never mind. Oh, my like, God. So, it's like. It's, Jesus. It's terrifying. You don't have any, like, wherewithal of customer service, let alone somebody's life is in your hands. It's, it's your wild. Cons- like, I was taking, like, suicide prevention courses and, like, domestic abuse courses and, like, all this stuff it was very nuts you had a really unheavy life (laughs) (laughs) yeah surrounded by death and like all this other stuff (laughs) but like it was it was really wild and I was dating somebody at the department he was a cop and we were living together and I had that moment where I was like okay well if I stay this is my life this Mm -hmm. is what I'll do because I was working full time I had benefits they wanted to send me to the police academy to get trained as a reserve officer. Oh my and God. I was can like, you imagine if that's your no. parallel universe right now? I mean, I can, but it's horrifying. Yeah. And I'm like, that's what my life would have been. And I was like, I, I have to go. And nobody really believed me when I was leaving. So when I, <laughs> the day that when I drove cross country, no one believed that I was actually leaving. So I left and no one was home. Like nobody was there to like say goodbye. There was no like, you know, whatever. Oh I God. like just left. And then my mom at like six o'clock, she calls me. She goes, hey, you're coming over dinner. Where are you? And you're I was like, like, Ohio. I'm driving across the country right now. Like I'm not coming oh home Oh my dinner. God. It's nuts. That is crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. So and what made you pick Los Angeles? Well, I knew if I picked New York, that was the safer bet. Too close. It, yes. And I knew that if I loved it and got comfortable, I would never make the jump to Los Angeles. Right. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do the harder one first. Mm-hmm. Because then if I don't like it, I can always go to New York. Right. And so, and uh, you can't be the weather either. So I was yeah. like, I'm going to come out here. And my best friend was here too. She'd been living here for a few years. And so she was a makeup artist out here and an actor. And I was like, all right, at least I have like one, one touchstone. Person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I got out here. I was 23 when I moved here. And um, I started doing improv and sketch that's kind of how I got like my foray into comedy how did you even find that because that's how I started too was improv and sketch yeah um I (laughs) and I just like to know how other people discovered it because this is literally such a fluke for me this is literally how I discovered it I was still I was working at the police department and um we have a tv in the dispatch area because a lot of the times you're just bored and I remember watching something and Tina Fey was on and they were talking about like how she got her start at Second City I was like, what's that? And I like Googled Second City. That's what I did. I Googled Second City. I Googled it and saw that there was one. In college. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I saw that there was one in LA and I was like, all right. And so I literally just like was like, I'll, (laughs) I'll, I guess I'll drive out in time for this class. And so I got to LA on a Monday. I started class on a Friday. That was me with Chicago. for years. Yeah. That's exactly how it went down. Yep. That's so funny. It was just completely random. (laughs) So funny. And yeah, it's just, it is such a weird thing because I feel like too, a lot of people, when you talk to them, especially male stand-ups I find, are all like, oh yeah, you know, I, I used to watch a ton of comedy when I was younger and like I knew since I was a kid that I wanted to do this. And I'm like, not me, like not at all. Yeah, me either. Not as a kid. I mean, I watched like Whose Line Is It Anyway? And we used yeah. to play those games that yep. are like Same. parties and stuff. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you're aspiring to that. Like I, I was always intrigued by that mm-hmm. stuff. But I never knew it was an actionable job. I don't think we knew it was really accessible for us either as women because you mm. weren't seeing a lot of female comics at no. that point. And we know? weren't just t- we weren't told that that was like really an option. Yeah. And I like I remember watching stuff on, you know, like Comedy Central or whatever and liking it, but never like grasping that it was something that I could do. Mm-hmm. And it was funny because I like I said, I did improv and sketch for so long. And then I had a few people be like, I feel like you should try stand up. I think you'd be really good at it. And mm-hmm. I was like, "Ugh, no." Same. I was, I like, was like, "I'm no. above stand up. I can make things up on the spot." Yeah. <laughs> it was like it, it for me I was just like, I don't have any desire to do that. Right. Like I couldn't and then again I was like stuck in like in a rut with acting. I like didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I was that asshole actor that we all fucking hate that was like, "I guess I'll take a class in stand up." And like fit, like that's how I started, but and everybody shits on taking class to start stand-up. And for me, I was like, you can't teach somebody to be funny. But you can teach them structure. writing exercises, structure, accountability. Mm-hmm. You can get in an environment where you're comfortable, where there's you know eight people in your class and you can get up on a mic. And it, when you're a woman and starting out, it's really daunting and scary to go to open mics because they're so male-dominated. Yeah. They're kind of toxic a lot of the time. Yeah. You, don't, you don't feel safe and welcomed. And so I, that's how I started. And then like I remember the first time I did it, had my first show. And I was like, oh, 
this is what I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. Like, this is it. That's e- That was exactly how I felt, too. Yeah. The first time I ever did it. And, I, and you know, and there's definitely some eye-opening things that you go through as a young woman in comedy. Mm-hmm. I When I first started stand-up, I was super excited because I was like, oh, there's this whole underground scene of open mics. That's a whole thing. Yeah. And like a mic that you can just go yeah. to and talk about shit i was so intrigued by it and i think the the thing that's really appealing about stand-up comedy too and you know coming from a sketch and improv background that you have to rely on other people so often for that stuff and like their schedules and whatever the best part about stand-up is that flying by yourself yep it is just you and 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 nobody can take that away from you yep you can you can drop yourself in any city and you can find a mic and you can do stand-up comedy in any fucking city. yeah and that's why people like have asked me like how do you perform in the caribbean every year i'm like uh, one of my best friends lives there and i'm the only fucking comic that comes there and does any sort of stand-up yeah so that's how yeah. and there is a venue with a microphone and then they have me perform. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's how it's so great. <laughs> it's not bad. And like, and I, it's so funny. Cause like, I'm very, I love order and like, I love like scheduling and I love like color coding things. And like, I'm very like, I'm annoying like that. Mm-hmm. And so like, for me, I love like people are like, Oh, I don't want to book like a tour. Like I'm like, I fuck it. I almost have I more love fun. It too. I have more fun doing that I, than doing the actual show. I shows. think we're long lost best buddies. I go, honestly, like, dude, ugh. I, I love, that's why I love working on boss comedy with Courtney. Like we're expanding to New York and we're going to be there every month. And I'm like, I can't wait. That's so dope. I, we're so excited. Cause I'm like, I'm glad to have a buddy on this kind of stuff mm-hmm. with me. But like I book, I book all my own tours. People are yeah, like, why too. don't you have so-and-so to book it? I'm like, I could. I mean, you know, I know at some point I'll have I'll be big enough where somebody will have to take over some of that stuff for me. But I love the relationships I have with venues. Yeah. I love that I can go to a hotel and be like, this is my track record. This is what I'm doing with this hotel in this city. I'd like to do it with yours and have no middleman. And I just yeah. deal with them directly. You know what else is great? Not paying somebody 10 percent. Yeah. <laughs> or more. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I had, I had a, like, I was with a very big management company um, for a little over a year, and my manager left abruptly in September. And so when I did Conan, like, she got the ball rolling, but I essentially did Conan alone and was getting, like, emails where it's like, your client, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, nope, this is a one-woman yep. show. But it is, like, I, I'm kind of at that point where I'm like, well, I'm not going to sign with anybody just for the sake of having a manager. I do so much work on my own. Same, yeah. That I'm like, if somebody has to bring something to the table. You know, yeah. like, somebody needs to come in and have connections at wherever and knows how to, like, step it up. But I'm like, in, in terms of, like, booking and going on the road and whatever, I'm like, I can do that easily on my yeah. own. Yeah, and it's it's really not, like... And I had to part ways with some of, with part of my team um, back in November because they saw that I had made my own deal residency with Vegas and called me and were like, hey, where is our cut? And I was like, no, no, I made this deal by myself. I flew to Vegas. I found the venue. Like, yeah. I'm the one that flies myself there every week. I do all the promotion for it. Yeah. This is my baby. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but that's not how <laughs> this yeah. works. Well, I was so frustrated because with my manager, I was, you know, I opened for, um, for Dana Gould a lot on the road. And it's very frustrating because when you're a feature, you know, you don't make a lot of money. Yeah. And you're, most of the time you have to buy your own flight. You have to, um, find your own place to stay. Sometimes they'll put up a feature, but most likely they don't. And most features, like full disclosure, you make about 500 bucks to the weekend, which if you're local, that's fucking dope. But when you're flying when you're from everywhere else, yep. you're lucky if you break even. And so, you know, my manager was like, well, you have to give me 10% of that. And I was like, okay, but this is something that I had set up a year before I even knew you. Yeah. And I'm not making anything off of this. And so I'm like, well, do I give you 10% of what I make, like what I'm actually taking home or off of the top. And she's like off the top. And I was so frustrated because I'm like, you know, I'm not making anything. Yeah. But now I'm already giving you 10% of, yeah. it, I, I was, it was just so frustrating. And until honestly, until you're to a certain point and now, you know what, it's so, um, and you run a big show here, which I'll have you obviously plug later. Um, when you, when you give a shit about this career, I shouldn't say you shouldn't run a show if you don't give a shit, but it, like, it's the same with if you want to be on a TV series now, you have to create and like pitch your own stuff yep. and shoot your own content kind of thing. If you want to be a comedian that people like want to be a, I shouldn't just say that, but it, it's a community thing. Like running and producing a show builds community. Yes. 
Like, I love at Boss Comedy when other comedian friends of ours come and just fucking hang out. Yeah. And, like, being a part of that just helps feed the community. Mm -hmm. So I shouldn't say that you should be running a show, but I think a lot of people benefit from it. It's just a positive thing. I think if you're a comedian and you have never run a mic or run a show, you have no business continuing to do that. Because you have to, like, it's like... You have like living in a neighborhood. You have to you have to contribute to where you live. Yes. And if you're living in stand up comedy, we, it's not about <laughs> it's not about what stand up comedy can do for you. It's what you can do <laughs> for stand up comedy. comedy. <laughs> but like, but it's true. Like one of the best things I ever did was I ran an open mic for two years. Yeah. I learned so much. I did doing that in that. Chicago. It was great. Yeah. You learn how to host, which is a thankless and not easy job. Yes. You know, and like producing comedy, you learn so much about like, hey, don't be a dickhead when you're sending booking emails. Yeah. Don't haunt someone's life and email them seven hundred times. Yeah. When you know that they run a monthly show and they book five people. Like, yeah. you know, you just, you learn so much through doing it and, and it, it's y- just, it's yep. important. And just how to be considerate. Like even today I had um, somebody from New York who's in town this week email about being on Boss and we're really full. And I was like, I'm sorry, we can't get you on this week, but come and hang out and we're going to put you on in New York next month because we have, we're expanding to New York. And she had like sent me a video and stuff. And yeah. I was like, hey, so, you know, so nice to meet you. Um, by the way, we don't take videos just so you know for next time like we just book people that we know are great and it's easy yeah. to figure that out because we know everybody yeah so i was like you know i appreciate you sending that but like if you ever want to just do a spot just hit us up like yeah. we're not you know we're not going to take hours and hours a week watching video like yeah you know and i don't mean that in a bad way but like i think there's a lot of people taking videos that don't need to be well it's like <laughs> it's crazy because i know like with mermaid it's so frustrating because we get so many submissions and people get really indignant when they, when you don't book them. And mm-hmm. like I said, we are monthly. We have six spots a month that we fill. We're two yeah. white ladies that run a show. So we have to be diverse with it. Yeah. And you, you have know? to, you have to keep changing it. Like, I think I did mermaid for you when it was pretty new, like f- four or five years ago. Yeah. At, at the, when it was still at still IO. At IO. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, and that's what I understand about booking too. And why I'm not annoying with messaging people about their shows is I'm like, I get it. And also like, also, the biggest thing that you realize is how few people are a draw. Yeah. And when somebody's not a draw, but they they see their value as so much higher than it is, oh my it's God, so I fascinating. Know. Is it everybody th- you're just like, oh it my god. It is so fascinating. Yeah. And I it like and sometimes I want to like shake people and like I had a I had somebody who's a younger comic ask me for help because they were going to Europe for just a trip and they wanted to book a show in Dublin. Mm -hmm. And um, I had just done the tour with Rachel and they were like, can you help me set this up? And I was like, listen, I can set it up for you. It's going to take me like two full days worth of time for me to find you a venue and get you like a contract, but I can do it. And I said, in return, I need you to know in order to get the seats filled, you can't just do a one post on your Instagram story. Yeah. Just because you think that you're a big deal, you have to private message people, and t- it's it's a different country. Yeah. You do not have as much of a draw as you think. They didn't listen. They only had two tickets sold. <gasps> and they got canceled. And it made me look bad. You oh, know? my God. Yeah. yeah. People don't realize if you're – if you are not – like, that's why Eliza and certain people are so successful because – they interact with their audience. Like you have to message people and be like, when you're in this space until you're like uber famous and you can sell out wherever you have to be like, yo, I see you live in Denver. I'm coming yeah. to Denver and tell your friends would love to have you at this. Sh- it's like, yeah. it sounds stupid, no, but you like have to. you have to, cause nothing, there's nothing to set you apart from anybody. Like yep. you may be talented as fuck. Yep. I know some of the funniest people that can't sell anything mm-hmm. and they, and they should, you know, they've done late night and blah, blah, blah. But like, It's like you, it's really fascinating to see how few people can actually pull people in LA. And so really for me and Courtney, it's been about us building the brand ourselves. Yeah. Not expecting to book anybody that's even remotely a draw. Isn't it so funny too, when you do a blast on your social media where, and you'll do like, you'll post about, you know, like you said, like like going to Denver, you'll post about it like 25 times. And then the show will pass. It'll be the next day. And somebody will be like, oh, my God, why didn't you say you were coming to Denver? Uh-huh. And it's like, I'm going to punch you in the throat. Yeah. Like, you want to know what I started doing. to do? And this is, like, something that any comic should do. So anytime somebody DMs me, because mm-hmm. we get so many, it's too hard to figure out when somebody messaged from where. 
anytime somebody direct messages me on Instagram or Facebook or whatever it is, their city and asks if I ever come, I screenshot it and I email it to myself with the subject, that city. That's so smart. And I keep it all in a folder of followers. So when I'm going to, like I'm going to New York, um, obviously next month with Courtney, I have all my friends in New York, but I'm also going to go through and message every one of those New York people. All I do is search New York and subject and it pulls up all of them. And I direct That's message so everybody smart. and I say, hey, I know you're waiting for when my next New York show is. Well, here it is. We would love to have you there because if you don't do that, people forget. There's so mm -hmm. much shit like an, like a mom in Iowa is not going to be checking your story every day for when you're touring. It's also getting harder <laughs> and harder to get people out of their living rooms, too, mm -hmm. because there's so much stuff online. Everyone's just consuming things on social media, on their you know laptops and whatever. That it's like when you have a live show, it's like really tough to get people out. Yeah. And you know what's pretty crazy right now? And I'll, I, <laughs> there was a company that asked if I would be the first ambassador for them in the comedy space um, that live streams shows that people don't want to go to. And I'm trying to decide if it's a, if wait, it's a good idea wait, or not. Wait, wait. So they started in the live streaming space for um like conventions mm -hmm. and they they're a tech startup and i'm really into the tech startup space and so um th i met them at tech crunch in san francisco and i love finding this out about i you. know i'm just staring <laughs> blankly at you right now somebody was trying to explain to me like digital money today like bitcoin and you just like i glazed over within like 10 seconds so you just you just being like oh, you know like the tech space i'm like huh <laughs> So these guys I met and they were like, yeah, I'm doing, we're doing this and we really want to parlay into entertainment. And I was like, well, you know, I'd love to maybe partner with you on like my Vegas show or a show that like I want people to be at every week, but they won't come from like New York or they won't come from. Yeah. But like, that's the thing is like, I don't, I, I don't want to like necessarily perpetuate comedy as being something you can watch as a live stream yeah. that's such a weird concept so well, i think people don't know too how different the experience is being in the room versus watching it on a screen mm -hmm. like it's that's why improv doesn't translate and that's why people are trolls on the internet yeah. nothing le nothing translates the same way mm -hmm. and you watch something on tv uh, you know I'm, that's why you can't read the comments on shit just oh girl <laughs> i read the comments on my conan no set. i was a fucking fool no. and did it and have. i spiraled out because it is it, like you're and you're and it doesn't even matter. Like it could be. A Did you get like a thousand women aren't funnies? Yes. Yeah. Which is also funny. Because Just discard those right away. I know. I also had I had a well, I talked about it on stage for like a second at, right after I shot it because I was like, I just want to say that trolls really have stepped up their game. Like they're becoming better people because I read the comments and, you know, I didn't get a single <laughs> she's fat or ugly. It was just about that I wasn't funny. And like, what do I do with this newfound respect? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, know, yeah. Like, I mean, at least. Oh, God. Yeah. And I had like, you know, on some of my videos from like Laugh Factory and stuff on Instagram, same kind of shit. Women yeah. aren't funny. Women aren't funny. But they also like no, no hit on it. <laughs> on any of these comedy clubs or whatever, but when they try to cut your clip down to a 60-second clip, they kind of butcher it. Oh, they have no idea. Like, it's like, oh, well, yeah, th of course this isn't <laughs> like, funny. You left out the setup. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my <laughs> God. Like, they did, and, like, sometimes they do. Like, they, they did one clip of mine that was really great, and then another one that was, like, cut down in a really choppy way, so it didn't even flow well. Oh and God. I was like, well, of course people think this isn't funny because it's not. Yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah, and what have been some of your hardest experiences in the stand-up space, obviously, leading up to this point? And how long have you been doing stand-up? Um, I've been doing stand-up now for July will be six years. Okay. So about five and a half. Okay. Um, I think that's right. Uh, yeah. But it, it is weird. And, you know, I think I was lucky, right? Or is it? Yeah, that's right. Oh, my God. I know. Um, time. I'm like, mm. Time but is a bitch. It is one of those things where I think that – I succeeded at doing stand-up faster because I had an improv and sketch background. Yeah. So I wasn't scared of getting on stage. I, you know what I mean? It wasn't like me holding a microphone was terrifying. It was yeah. just like, oh, this is the same thing. I'm just by myself. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so yeah, about, about five and a half years. Yeah. And what has been some of like the hardest things that you've been through besides the reps and having to book your own stuff and deal with that kind of stuff? I think... Um, well, first of all, that's, you know, I, I run an all-female show, and part of the reason why I did that was because there wasn't enough performance opportunities for women. And even though I had just started, I was, like, pissed 
You know, I just, I was like, I don't understand why all of these shows are so male dominated. There's so many funny women and there's, there needs to be more spaces and opportunities. And so I was only a year into stand up when I started Mermaid. Wow. And I had no clue what I was doing. I, um, Jolene Lunzer, who's super funny and amazing and my co-producer for Mermaid. And when I started it, I was doing it alone, but I asked for her advice because I knew that she had been doing stand up a lot longer than me. She, you know, was traveling for it and whatnot. And so I was like, how do you, how do you run a show? Like, Mm -hmm. how do you do it? And so she kind of gave me the breakdown. And when I started it, I did it for the first two years, I think, by myself. And then after I was like, she's been there along the way anyway. And she is so goddamn funny. We have so much fun together. Then I'm like, we should just do this together. It helps to have a partner. It really does. I love having, I love working with Courtney. Yeah. And like, and it's even funny, like how much Mermaid has transformed over the, the few years. Because when I first started it, like I said, I was solo and then it was both of us and we would take turns hosting. But then we learned that if we riff for like five minutes up top, everyone, so many people will come up to us and they're like, you guys have such good chemistry together. It's yeah. so fun to watch you guys fuck around at the top yeah. of the show. Yeah, yeah. And then it, it's just, and then we gave ourselves sets within the show because I also realized too the frustrating part when you do run a show is that a lot of times people will only look at you as a host and not a regular comedian. Yeah. And because hosting is thankless, even though it's harder than being sometimes than being yes, a headliner, absolutely. That it, you know, you you need to make sure that you're getting seen and being valued just as much as anybody else in the lineup, especially when you're putting in all the work to run a show. Exactly. Yeah. And it it, it is so much fucking work. Yeah. Even just monthly. That's why I got burned on in Vegas. I was like, because I I I was getting the audience to come and see me every week. And I was closing out the show any week that I didn't have a headliner. So I was alternating headlining every week. Yeah. And then also booking it. And it was like. (laughs) That's a lot. (laughs) It was so much. Yeah. In a new market where I didn't even know the comedians. Granted, now I do. And I fucking love the Vegas scene. But I like. But it's, it's, you know. It was a lot. You'd think, I feel like, and I don't know too much about the Vegas scene, but I feel like it's probably similar to, to a city like. Nashville, where they're not known for comedy, they're known for something else. Yeah, and so it's hard because you're constantly fighting, getting with, them to come. Yes, to that. getting them to like pulling yeah. them away from something else. You know, like with like with Nashville, it's like you're, it's like no, you don't have to see music every night. You can also come to a comedy. Right, show. I know. You, you think know? you'd get burnt out on tr- on country at some point? Yeah, <laughs> or like I'm sure with Vegas, it's like. You don't need to not know what time it is in a cold room while gambling your life away. Yeah. Like, come and see something else. Well, and that was a big thing was, like, I – there were some shows that I'd go out afterwards if I had people in town, which was pretty pretty often. But nothing ra- – it was a mo- it's a Monday night show, so it wasn't like, let's go fucking do a bunch of blow. And, like, yeah. it wasn't that kind of <laughs> – you know, but, like, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Vegas is a taxing city, and that's for sure. But I do suggest that people – you know, and I have get people that message me like probably one person a week like, oh, you inspired me to start stand up or you inspired me to do this. You inspired me to do that. I'm like, great. But know that know of the amount of work that you're going to have to do. Like I encourage people. I'm yeah. like, do it. But like you have you got to It's work. not easy. Somebody you messaged me and it's like and I love her. And she was just like, how do I ease into stand up? I was like, there's no easing into it. <laughs> you just have to do you just have to do it. You know, like you kind of like just, anal. Yeah. You, you know, just, <laughs> just, just no, it's not yeah. like anal. <laughs> anal, you can ease into it. This is worse. <laughs> yes, it is. It's far worse. It, stand up is much more painful than anal. I just want you all to it know. It is. Yes. Ugh. And it's crazy that this year, this year is going to be my, in August, is it July or August? It's going to be my 10th. This year is my 10th wow. year stand up. Congratulations. Crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. It goes by fast. Yeah, it goes by really fast. I think back. I was I was talking to somebody um, that my because my first show was like our class show, but then the second show that I did after that was at Busby's East, which you know is like a. Vacu- I used to run a show there. Okay, it's like a vacuous stage. Yeah, and um and I have it on tape, and I've never watched it. Oh my god! I I'm wonder. Sure it's terrible. I wonder whose <laughs> show that was because I I live near there and I used to run a show there with Doug Fager for like a year and a half I, I know that it was kind of a bringer like it was I remember being on the lineup um Malik I think was on it um on An- Anya Malik is, is that his last name I think. yeah I think um, so I think he was on it uh I forget there's some other people on it too but it was like I remember going I first of all I wore a dress I'd never wear a dress oh that wasn't that definitely wasn't my no, show no 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 I wore a dress <laughs> like a weirdo I have mm-mm 
But yeah, I wore a dress, and I remember like, cause when you, I feel like when you start stand up, you think you know what stand up is, and you try to emulate it. Yeah. Where that's not what it is. You just the best thing you can do is be yourself. Yeah. And so I just remember like. I watched that tape right after I did it and being like, I hate this person on stage. And like I said, I've been, always been pretty self-aware. So yeah. I'm like, well, we need to fix this shit real quick. Yeah. Because I was very bitchy on stage and that's not me at all. Yeah. And I still, since that day of doing it, I have not gone back and watched it. And I'm oh like so terrified <laughs> to watch it. I actually want to have a party one night and just have like all the girls over and watch our old stand-up tapes. Oh, God. Because it would be so, I have a whole CD case. Everything I used to do at Comedy Store and like Tammy Jo Deeren's early yeah. shows, I used to I used to pay twenty five bucks for this guy Michael Merton to record them. Oh my on god! C- on DVD, <laughs> on fucking DVD. Oh, oh, oh god! Time is crazy, but yeah. And he would um, give you one DVD with the raw footage and one DVD with it like edited with your name on it at the oh beginning. My god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and now we can do that on our phone. That's such a crazy idea. I know. Can you imagine that you used to have to like mail out tapes? Yeah. Like I did. When I first moved to LA, I had a reel that was on a CD. Yeah. Had like fif- like 15 to 20 of them made. Oh my god. And then the first time there was one time that I tried to like upgrade that when things started to shift like before things got really digital and I had I would send people a little SD card like memory sticks. Oh, my God. Like a little eight gigger memory stick with my reel on it. <laughs> they probably never would use it because they were like, this is definitely a virus. I did. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Like she's hacking our system. Or I something. have so many stacks of like old headshots. Oh, my God. And me too. like stacks of D- of CDs of like sessions from headshots. Mm-hmm. And I like I don't know what to, I like can't bring myself to throw them away, but I don't know what to do with them. Yeah, I know. I don't want to throw them away either because they were like hundreds and thousands of dollars. Yeah. It was so expensive. It's just so, it's so crazy to think that we've moved that far beyond that space. Nothing, nobody even takes a headshot anymore. I know. They're, and they look at you like you're psycho. If where you they're like, um, <laughs> we're green. And it's like, cool, because I spent a lot of green to get these made. So I yeah. guess I'll just burn them in a fire. Yep, exactly. Can mm-hmm. I just give it to you anyway so I feel better about my life? <laughs> what do you have coming up that you're excited about? Because this comes out tomorrow, so it's nice and fresh. Oh, damn. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, actually, uh, tomorrow night, if you're around, I'm hosting the 8 p.m. show at the Improv. Tuesday. So, so the day that this comes out. Tuesday t- the 21st. Tonight. 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 <laughs> it will be the Improv at 8 p.m. Uh, hosting their main room show. Um, I am... Maybe uh, I'll come hang. You should. Come hang. Yeah. Um, then the next Mermaid... Uh, so the show that I run is Mermaid Comedy Hour. It's monthly. It's all female. The next one is February 10th. It's at the Improv in the Lab. And it's at 8 o'clock, and it is my co-producer's uh, 40th birthday show. Ah, nice. So we're going to have a big party. It's going to be really fun. Great. So uh, come support. It'll be a really good time. And I, I guess other than that, I don't – I have to – oh, and in March, um, I'll be headlining um, a show for Bird City Comedy Festival in Phoenix. Yeah. So if you're in Phoenix, uh, I will be there in March uh, towards the end of the month. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. What do I have coming up? This week, I have Boss Comedy Wednesday. It's usually Sundays. But this month we had somebody bought out like all the weekends. I don't know. Somebody, Where, the somebody store? big. Yeah, like in the belly room. Somebody big is just going to be up there. I don't know what's going on. But so we have Wednesday this week and it's Ooh. a really great lineup. So Boss Comedy, uh, 10 p.m. on Wednesday in the belly room at the comedy store. Thursday I'm at Free Parking in Culver City. Um, next week. Where the fuck am I on next week? Go to my website, mphcomedy.com. I'm doing the same thing. Yeah, you can go to <laughs> ValerieTossi.com for all this stuff. And follow me on, on social media. Yeah, plug your social media. It's just at Valerie underscore. Yes, mm-hmm. the coveted underscore. Mm-hmm. My last name, Tossi. So yeah, it's Valerie underscore Tossi. And I will tag her in everything. Uh, my website is mphcomedy.com backslash TIX for all tickets upcoming. Um, definitely get your tickets. Save the date for Boss Comedy's expansion to New York, February 12th. And uh, got a bunch of shows coming up. I am headlining, or I'm featuring in DC for Neil Nanda, and then headlining the fifth day. So Ooh, I'll be headlining. That's rad. Yeah. So Neil and I will be working together Valentine's Day and the day after Valentine's Day, and then Sunday, two days before my birthday, February 16th, I will be headlining in DC. That's it's so my fun. first time playing DC, so I'm really excited for that. Um, th- March, I got some exciting stuff coming up in March. I will be talking more about a startup that i'm starting and i will be a tech startup yes um (laughs) it's cool i'm really excited for it and it's uh and that's gonna be um i'm gonna be debuting at a panel for that in chicago talking about that it's a women entrepreneur panel and i'll also be performing in chicago and denver in march 
and we'll start seeing the outroll of my prep and uh, PR for Edinburgh, which I'm performing in this year. Um, that'll start happening oh, in March. So rad. So yeah, my second hour is going to be debuting at Edinburgh. So prepare for all that. And if you're going to plan to be at the Edinburgh Comedy Festival this year, come see me. Cool. And that's it. Anything else you want to say in closing? Oh man, I don't know. Just. I'll go out there and just be nice to people. Don't be a dick. <laughs> right? Don't be a dick. Right. That's no. a bumper sticker, right? <laughs> it is. It, it For a reason. Be. No, I think it is. Yeah. All right. That's it. Bye. Bye.